it was not even an option, like thinking about it, oh, moving somewhere abroad, you know, work for international organizations. So for me, if somebody would tell me that time where I will be working, I was like, are you crazy? That's not going to happen. So I do um, recognize that I was really lucky or blessed with the opportunities that I had, absolutely. I suspect you also made quite a few of them for yourself. I mean, I, I know my mom and my stepmom, they just didn't take no for an answer. They just thought, yes, having five kids is not an obstacle to going to law school. That, mm -hmm. Like at the era that they did it, they thought that was a pretty big obstacle, but they said, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. That's why, I, that's why I invite you for this event, because I think that you, your story, your background, but also story of your family is, is really inspiring. It's really um, good for young people to hear that, absolutely. Well, I'll do my very best. <laughs> Daniela, are you still in Aruba? You're still at Aruba, well. How was the massage? That I was looking out the window and I was so surprised because this morning it was clear sky, but everything is gray and windy now because the hurricanes are coming. Because Gonzalo is. Oh, okay, that's not so good. I'm coming this way. But let's get started. Thank you ever so much for coming, ladies. And um, I'm going to first talk about today's event format. So we will begin with my co president, Anna Gorbachuk, and myself giving the opening remarks. Next, Christina Carey will be talking about her experience and career opportunities in the International Civil Service. Following Christina's speech, Magdalena Kopal will discuss her position in the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and her background at Webster University. And finally, we will have a Q&A session where you are all encouraged to ask any questions you may have about the field. Super. Welcome, everyone. We're so happy to attend our last event of the summer event series. Sigma Yotar Ho inducts and awards outstanding students, scholars, and international studies. The Honor Society was established in 1984 and now cleans 190 chapters and campuses all around the world. The Webster University chapter, ETA Alpha, was established primarily as a means to honor those students who have excelled both academically and professionally and have shown an amazing extracurricular activity achievement. So as um, some of you may know, the goal of our summer series event is to introduce our members to the breadth of possibilities available within international fields, ranging from graduate schools, working in the United States, in Europe, or even international communities. Today, we'll be hearing from two individuals with valuable insights in the field of international civil service and international law. We are honored to welcome two very accomplished women. First, we'll be hearing from Christina Carey. She has considerable expertise in international law, domestic law, and legal project management. She has applied her legal experience at her position at the university the International ICTY, ICC, UN, and now at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Next, we will hear from Magdalena Kopal, who is balancing her life as a graduate student at Webster University with her position at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. As a recruitment coordinator, Magdalena is responsible for a fair and transparent selection process of new staff members within the tribunal. But first, Christina Carey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I know I can't actually see any of you, but um, I, I am really honored to have an opportunity to speak to so many talented students who are pursuing a career in international, in international, in, well, international relations, international law, and are potentially looking ahead towards a career in international civil service. Um, I want to begin my discussion today and description of my own life in reflecting back on myself at the age of 17. And if you had told my 17 year old self, who was looking ahead towards university and what on earth I was going to do next. 
if you had told her that she was going to work for the United Nations, she would look at you and pretty much keeled over, died, and gone to heaven because it really was my absolute dream job. But the path to getting to this dream job was actually very much of a circuitous path and not one that was direct because I think when I was 17, I had no idea how to get there. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I wasn't even entirely sure what I wanted to spend my life on. And when you, when I walk you through what I've done in my life, you're going to get a pretty good picture that I wasn't always sure what I wanted to do with my life. And that's actually okay too. So um, the description of me is pretty much appropriate. I have, um, I have indeed worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, for the United Nations Secretariat, in the Office of Administration of Justice, for the International Criminal Court, and now I'm working for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. But what I've done in those different places is actually really very different and somewhat unusual. And before I got to any of them, I did some unusual things to start with. Um, I'm from the United States. And so I went to, um, if, if you know anything, some of you are Americans probably, and those of the rest of you may know something about the US uh, education system. You cannot actually go to law school as a first degree. So my first degree, um, my four year undergraduate degree was in medieval history. And at the time I was absolutely convinced, I went to Carleton College in Minnesota. Um, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to be a professor. I had grown up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and. As far as I could tell, the only thing that you could possibly do in your life beside, uh, is, uh, is either some form, some form, of, uh, some form of, of service work or be a university professor. Um, so when I went to university, I was sort of thought I was going to be a university professor. And I got to the end of my university time and indeed could have gone on to graduate school in, in medieval history, loved what I did, but wasn't quite sure at the age of 22 that I really wanted to be a professor. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do next. So I took some time out and I went back to Chapel Hill, uh, ostensibly to help my mom pack up her house and, and, and herself move to California. And at the same time decided I just wasn't sure enough what I wanted to do that it wasn't worth that, at that moment being in graduate school and spending the money on it. So I took a job as a sous chef in a Northern Italian restaurant, which I actually absolutely loved and I cooked for a living and my great, and pursued what was at the time my great passion, which was uh, indie rock and, uh, and, 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 and music. And so I got a gig on first a free, a, a free station, uh, a free, free community station playing indie rock, and then got called up and asked uh, if I wanted to audition for the equivalent of the sort of regional public radio station. And since that seemed like a good thing to do, I indeed auditioned, got a job, um, and that job took me to Portland, Oregon eventually, um, where at the age of 29, I found myself thinking, this has all been really interesting. I've managed to make my hobby into my living, but I'm not sure that it's as intellectually satisfying as, I, I just couldn't see myself doing it forever. I loved doing it while I did. I stayed out late, uh, <laughs> saw a lot of really great bands in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, and um, and that was really what I wanted to do then. But then it was sort of time to turn myself to something serious. And I then went back to law school. And I went to law school at Lewis and Clark, Northwestern School of Law, Lewis and Clark. And at that time, thought I was a grown up um, and thought that I was determined not to have a, uh, not to have a wild, wild life where I did uh, the, crazy, the crazy hours of litigation. So I was going to do intellectual property. I focused on intellectual property in law but took, took a lot of international private and public law courses because I found them really interesting. So I got out of law school, got an offer for, with a large law firm, and I did that for about a year and a half when um, the opportunity to come and do a very impermanent uh, short-term project for the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICTY came up, and I decided that it sounded like the most exciting thing I'd ever thought about, the thing that I dreamed about. So I went off and I did it. And when I got there, the project that I was on turned into, you're actually now going to be working for this trial team. So I ended up on the trial team working for the Vukovar, uh, the Vukovar hospital case in the ICTY. Thought it was incredibly interesting. It was truly my dream job. So then I never looked back. 
I worked in the trial team for a little while. Um, that that case actually ended up being sort of parked to the side, and um, I got an I got requested to um, potentially come up and work for the appeals unit um, because I'm more and in all fairness, I'm a more keen writer than I am taking cases in court. And so I went up with the appeals unit for the office of the prosecutor, where I worked for the rest of my time at the ICTY until 2009. During that time, uh, um, I was also beginning to be interested in how the how UN-based organizations, international organizations, worked as organizations. And I started volunteering my time, assisting staff members in administrative law cases, not necessarily ICTY staff members, but staff members around the UN common system. It was a way for me to learn international administrative law, learn more about how the organizations work, and also do something that was assisting staff members as a volunteer. That actually took me to being um, asked to be the interlocutor for the UN staff unions at the large global staff management negotiations, which go on every year about issues that relate to staffing. Um, and it was around the UN, the reform of the UN's administrative justice system. When the UN was created in 1946, um, it was imagined as a very small entity. And the justice system, the administrative justice system that it created was also surrounds a, surrounded a very small entity, which was essentially, it was a place in New York and Geneva where diplomats would go to argue and people would type things and provide interpretation and translation services. Obviously, you can know now that the UN is vastly different. In the 70s and certainly the 80s and 90s, it became this gigantic operations-based organization around the world doing all sorts of very different things. And it's just this, its internal justice system just was not keeping pace with what the organization had become. So I was, um, I, I started out on the staff union side. I was an interlocutor for them coming up with proposals. We reached agreement with management and then the department of management had to, had the oblig, had the, then with these agreements, needed to put them forward to the, to the general assembly, the fifth committee, the ACABQ and they, the person that I had been across the aisle from had realized that he was got an opportunity to go work in a mission in Kosovo, and he recommended me to come and take his place. And that was how I ended up with the UN Secretariat. So I went to the UN Secretariat. I was working then on the side of management to, um, put, to produce the Secretary General's reports and to create um, in a one year, in a one year time frame, a, an actual pathway for making these reforms go from paper to something that could actually happen with all the staffing that had been involved and opening registries and new courts around the UN system. Uh, I worked on that um, both for the Department of Management and then for the new Office of Administration of Justice until 2011. Then I was um, really, really missed the Netherlands and missed the world of courts and tribunals. And I saw an opportunity to go help the International Criminal Court on secondment from the UN to open up its first internal oversight mechanism. It was something that had been designed in the Rome Statute, but had never been operationalized. And it needed a kind of unique bundle of skills um, of somebody who could make proposals to the states, um, the states that are in the Assembly of States Parties, but also design an operational body that could function and then do the staffing for it. So I took that on. Um, I got that up and running. I, I probably would have actually really liked to have run it, but I'm unfortunately, as a US citizen, I'm not, the, not, not, not a state party of the ICC, so that wasn't going to be an option for me. And from there, I moved to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. The first thing that I did at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon was to head up the Victims Participation Unit. And my job there was essentially to it was one part administrative because you administer the legal aid policies, um, which administer the, the different counsel who assist victims in presenting their views and concerns before the court. And the other part was legal and operational. I enjoyed that work, but indeed, I came to believe as I got older 
that the thing that I probably did uniquely well in a strange sort of way was that I fused having a good legal mind and knowing how legal institutions work, but actually really liking to work with people. And so the last stage of my career has been to make a fairly unusual transition to heading up um, human resources and change management for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. So what, that's what I do right now. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, what my job is, is to manage the human resources team, which is a, a team of highly skilled professionals who do three different specific tasks. They um, engage, they're engaged in the staffing and recruitment side, which means attracting suitable candidates to the special tribunal, ensuring that there is a fair and transparent process by which we uh, bring on, uh, we, we take, we assess candidates and then turn them into actual staff members of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. We, and then the process of actually introducing them to the court, bringing them on board from all over the world. We also then administer the benefits and entitlements of international civil servants in three different duty stations. Um, that's the second element of what the human resources and change management section does. And finally, we do organizational development and change management. That involves training, ensuring that there are training programs for staff, also for managers, that we, um, that because we are a limited mandate organization, which will indeed finish its work, we also have to um, have an obligation to try to do the best that we can to assist our own staff members in finding their next opportunities. That involves provi providing them with career transition services. And then we also, as part of organizational development, we operate the health and welfare team uh, that includes the medical officer who does occupational health, an occupational health nurse, and a staff welfare officer who is a staff psychologist. Um, I'm just thinking to myself what uh, skills I have had in all of this that have served me well. First of all, the first job that I had did actually require that I have law degree. I had to be, uh, I had to have, um, I not only had to have a degree in law, but I had to be called to the bar uh, or my, or law society in my relevant jurisdiction. That's not always true. Sometimes one can be a legal officer in the context of the United Nations and not be called to bar or law society, but actually just have completed your first or second degree in law. And in the case of prosecuting for any of these Courts, you do indeed need to have both a law degree and a and basically being called to the bar. Um, I think, and obviously one does generally need, not for all positions, but it's helpful to have a master's degree. Um, I think a variety of different uh, master's degrees can actually be useful in the international context, not only the law context, and certainly it's the case with international courts and tribunals only a relatively small number of the functions actively require a law degree. The vast majority of them just require a master's degree. And we do, we are not, the international courts are kind of unlike anything that you've ever experienced. In a national court system, your court is doing just the court functions, but it's bolted onto a large national system. And in the context of the international community, we are actually the all singing, all dancing bear. We do so many things that you would never imagine in a national court because the government does them, but not necessarily the court. So we, for example, have a very large human resources and management section. We also have to administer our budget. So we have a large finance section. We have special procurement rules because international organizations indeed must make sure that they procure large contracts for goods and services in a fair and transparent way. So we have procurement, that's a very specialized skill. We have security and safety for ourselves. And also um, we have, although it's less relevant for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon at the moment, because we have no, we have trials in absentia. For the International Criminal Court and the ICTY, we had active detention units, pe people who ran our detention unit within the, they are a subset of the Dutch prison system, but they are international in character. As I mentioned, one of the aspects of the team that I work with are, is a medical officer, a nurse, and a staff, wealth, a staff psychologist. We have victims and witnesses, which deal with 
So people who have experience in social work, uh, in psychology, uh, sometimes in protection elements, policing analysis, um, and of course, then a lot of what happens in international organizations involves interacting with the larger realm of states and state politics and state actors, the host state, other states, unlike your national courts, we don't have a national police service that we can call upon. We have to ask states to do all the work that, or at least allow us on the grounds, on their grounds to do that work. And that means that a great deal of what international courts and tribunals do is negotiate with states, is do what is really diplomatic work. And so there's, for those who have international relations backgrounds, there's a whole variety of things to be done. We also do communications, outreach to the communities that we're in, um, court management stuff, uh, IT services. We, do, we, I mean, we have an entire completely enclosed network which protects all of the information that exists within the court. And so we have, we have our own audiovisual department, which makes sure that you can see and hear all of the, all of the actual courtroom proceedings, no matter where you are in the world. Um, if you look at the larger UN, one of the things I found an interesting story that relates to staffing and recruitment is when the United Nations um, was going to change its, its cre internally created recruitment platform called Galaxy. And there was a lot of criticism from states. Why didn't you just choose an off-the-shelf product that had been created by you know, a, a, a big company? And, and they, they thought, okay, fine, we're going to do that. So they engaged with PeopleSoft to create um, what is now Inspira. And if any of you apply for a job at the UN, you're going to in interact with Inspira. I was there when we were moving from Galaxy to Inspira. And one of the things that happened was, even though PeopleSoft is a very good program that is extremely robust, there is no employer in the world like the United Nations. There, the number of places that people come from, think of the drop-down menu that you use when you're looking for something. The number of places that people come from, the number of places where each of their employers come from are, were located, the, the number of drop-down menus, and the number of professions, because the United Nations has doctors, it has people who are working directly in almost military, working directly with peacekeeping forces, it has, it has doctors, it has an, it has an air, it has a civilian transport system that includes aircraft like 757s and helicopters, so it has aircraft, it has airplane technicians. If you multiply this, think, think, you know, you know, all over the world, the number of functions are so enormous that honestly, when they launched the first run of Inspira, it crashed because the inputs required to maintain the staffing of the United Nations and to take in applications overwhelmed the system. So, um, I think. I'm just trying to think. I'm, I'm getting a bit. I'm getting a bit off track here, but what I would say is that there are so many opportunities in the United Nations generally, and then within. If you're an EU, if you're from the EU, the the, EU, the European Union is a similar array of positions in international civil service, and then there are international NGOs. There is really. Uh, it's 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 almost like a universe of stars in terms of what you might actually find for yourself. So turning then, so what skills are valuable? Um, I, it's not so much the kind of degree that you have, although I think having international, an international program where you, I mean, it helped me a great deal that even though I focused on intellectual property, I had done a good set of coursework that had an international focus in it. It was useful for me. But even if you don't have that, I think having an international mindset can help you. And then taking opportunities that you might have in school or in whatever, like if you have an opportunity to do an internship, to kind of have an international focus in what you do, that can be helpful. But it's definitely not necessary. You can still hop in just by virtue of taking the good skills that you have and the experiences that you have and relating them to something thing which is more international in focus. Um, on your CV, 
and the sort of what you want to highlight. I think you want to highlight uh, when you're when you're at the beginning. Don't feel that you have to somehow pretend that you've done a million things because you don't. What you really want to highlight is the particular kind. You want to look at an application that you see. We usually use we use competency-based interviews, and what you're going to see is you're going to see a description, and then you're going to see a group of competencies. And you want to think to yourself in that context about the competencies and say, that's really how I do something. There's the what I do and there's the how I do it. So the, the what I've done, when you're very, when you're at the beginning of your career, don't, don't worry. Just you want to focus on what you're ready to do. You want to highlight the things you have had to have an opportunity to do. And then be just, I would say, in, in and I, I've even had the had the the I had the fifth committee of the General Assembly say the first time that I appeared before them that one of the things that they really appreciated in me was that I was candid. I think being honest and being enthusiastic and, and just keep at it. So if you want to do it, don't feel discouraged. It can take a while. Um, the other thing that is really an advantage, and my own career is based upon it. And most of the people that I know who are now quite senior in the UN universe are also that way. Take limited, the one great thing that you have when you're young is that you have this superpower that you can do, you're very flexible. You can do things for a short period of time. You can take risks as you grow older, as you have kids, as you have family members that you have to worry about and consider their careers too. It gets harder, you become less flexible. When you are where you are now, in general, you have immense flexibility. So the first thing that I took at the ICTY, the, the stepping stone for me, was honestly a rule where I had no particular security and I had no idea how long it would last, but it was a chance to dive in and try. The other thing is put your hand up, always put your hand up. If you see something you want to try to do and nobody else is doing it or it's something that needs to be done, but nobody seems to have it in their job description. Say, I think I could do that and give me a try and I'll do it alongside all the things I'm otherwise doing. And those two, that, those two things will get you pretty much everywhere. And I think the last thing before I turn over to my billionaire who will also have lots of interesting things to tell you. Um, in terms of what opportunities are out there, there are, there is a wide constellation of opportunities, but the one thing that the, the UN can be a bit difficult about is getting your beginning experience. So it is useful to do an internship if you can. Otherwise, one other way to, to, to I, what I did was, I did my first year and a half in, in a, a national-based law firm. And then I had enough relevant experience as a lawyer that I could apply for and be accepted in the UN. So you don't always have to only have international. You might want to keep your eye on the things you're interested in and then think to yourself, how do I do the, the things that are open to me now? How will they look when I make that next when I make that next leap? And beyond that, in terms of the special tribunal for Lebanon and the international justice world generally, we are unfortunately um, in a bit of a contraction mode. So there's not a great deal, I would say, at the moment in the STL. But there is the Kosovo Specialist Chamber and Kosovo uh, Specialist Prosecutor's Office, and they are in an expansion mode, and there are going to be positions opening there at, at, at pretty much every level. Um, also, the International Criminal Court. There are two mechanisms, if you're very interested in international justice, two of the newest players on the horizon is, are the mechanism, the international, it, it is literally two I's and an M, but it involves Syria. There's a mechanism for Syria and a mechanism for Myanmar, and they are both based out of Geneva. And they are, they, you can find things that are, you can find their vacancies um, either on unjobs.org, which is not operated by the UN, or unjoblist.org, also not operated by the UN, but they are as good as any place to find, to keep up to date on jobs in all the different agencies, treaty-based organizations, and the U.S. experience. And with that, I think my time is more than up, and I'm going to let you go. 
Thank you so much for sharing your story, Christina. Um, right now we have time for Q&A, so if you'd like to type it or if you'd like to virtually raise your hand, please go ahead. Um, I think I'm going to start it off a little bit and ask you a question, Christina, about um, how you decided to make that leap to go back to law school at 30. I mean, I think for us, even at our age, we feel scared to, to make changes. And I, I, it's paid back for you. It's, I would say I was terrified. So every time I've made a major change, including going to become the chief of HR after being a lawyer, every time I'm terrified. I think you just have to be, I think you have to ask yourself, because you have, a, a, I, I, I don't want to interfere with anybody's faith and beliefs, but I tend to believe that I have this one life. And I have this one life to do the things that I, I, I'm most interested in. I think there are some important values like being kind to others and thinking of others before yourself. But I, I, do, I still do think that I have to fill my life with rich experiences and I have to take a chance. And the worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work and then you make another plan. But in this case, I desperately wanted to do international work. As I said, if you had told my 17-year-old self where I would be, she would have died and gone to heaven right then on the spot because that was really my dream job. I remember when I took my first job with the UN Secretariat and I walked into the New York headquarters, I actually did have a tear in my eye when I realized I was walking into that building, that building. I dreamed about it my whole life. But it wasn't obvious how I got there. And I think that's the part of trial and error. You sort of have to keep, you have to do, you, you'll see, you won't see the perfect opportunity, but you'll see an opportunity, or you'll see something you think, I really want to do this. And whether you're 22 or 32, or like my, my mom and my stepmom, who actually went back to school for their second careers, one as a lawyer and one as a psychiatric social worker, after they'd had all of their kids, um, the reality was that your, your heart will tell you what you really want to do. And, and whether you believe you have this one life or more lives or more time, I think doing the most of what you have in this life is important. I have a question here from Brandon Jackson. Okay. Um, he said, I just want to remark that it is incredibly important for people to understand the wealth of opportunity at the UN and the diverse set of skills the organization requires. I am an IT practitioner and the UN was not the first place my colleagues thought of, but especially in terms of security, it's incredibly important. Do you have any, any comments on that? <laughs> Not only do I have comments on that, I can tell you that if you want to have a career in IT and bring your, your incredible skills to the UN, I think you probably have a really good career. That's an area where there's so much growth and he's, he or she is not incorrect that the, we are becoming more and more aware in all of the organization, and particularly places like court and tribunals, which are highly secured environments. I mean, victims and witnesses' identities and are, can indeed be life, well, they can be a life and death matter. So, and, and governments and information that comes before the court can actually in, involve state secrets and be things that are very important. So the security of information is very, it's critical. It's one of the most core functions and the universe of IT is constantly changing. And again, international organizations are funded by, they're funded by people. They're funded by taxpayers all over the world. So we're not the highest, we're not, not the highest to work. We are not the best funded places to work. I, I, I feel certain one could make much more money working for Google, but if you bring skills like I, fantastic IT skills to us, I think you will have done something that, you'll be proud of forever. And over this past month, we've been talking a lot about getting jobs and how to build your resume and how to stand out. But we haven't talked about once you're in the position, what to do to make you stand out. So from the young people that you've seen that have come to work in your organization, what are things that you think that um, help first time workers to, to stand out or future for them and within the organization. Okay, so things that are really important when you come to your first job. One is, I mean, I think it goes without saying that it's really important to work hard. 
this is the time to dig deep and to really bring your best to the table. You want to, you want to always, there should be nothing that you say, that you hear, that you don't say, yeah, I can do that. You want to take risks. You don't want to be foolish. You don't want to say you can do things that you're really certain you can't do. But be honest and say, I mightn't have done this before, but I think I can do this. And then become, become, you know, become part of, become part of teams. And that is the next piece that's really important. International work more than even anything in your national system. When you work with people who come from more than 200 countries, there are a lot of different work cultures. There are a lot of different cultural expectations. It's very important to be a good team player. And that means re remembering you, what you know is not always first. And, and how you work is not always the right way. Because it can be difficult when you, if you, you never really think to yourself when you take your first jobs in within your own country, that you are singing from a song sheet that kind of, everybody kind of knows the same music. But when you go to the international world, everyone does not sing from that song sheet. And it's really important to find the value in each other and find common ways to communicate and to work as a team. So I think hard work, bringing your best, bringing your best to work every day, but really also thinking about the fact that international work is quite different. You're gonna be encountering cultures and cultural expectations that are very different from yours. And you have to be really, you have to really be open to, to having those people make the best, you need, your job is not only to give your best contribution, it's to make sure your team members can also contribute as best they can. And, and if you are doing those things, you're gonna find that you're a really good international civil servant. And within that, I would just say, it isn't always very easy. And, and you know, just recognizing that sometimes you're gonna feel frustrated, sometimes you're gonna feel, feel confused, it's going to be easy to sometimes not know if you've done the right thing. So being open and 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 giving and saying I'm not sure, I don't know, did I hurt your feelings? Those things will serve you in really good stead. Also, I have actually two questions. So I will start with the first one, and that's regarding the linguistic opportunities and values. So, for example, if a person is applying for internship or job uh, in the UN. So what would be the most important, let's say, top three languages that would be extremely useful um, when applying to such positions? As we know, there are five, um, five official languages, but what would be the most important ones, let's say, if, if the person considering to work in the European field and be involved there in various organizations? Okay, language is one of the things I will say, and I, I, I probably should have, it shows a blind spot, but I didn't say it. One of the great advantages I had that I often am aware that my colleagues are having to do much more work than I do. I speak English as a native, and English and French in the UN are the two predominant languages. That doesn't mean, it depends region, regionally, it can be very advantageous to know other languages. So if, for example, you're working in the Middle Eastern region, it could be extremely advantageous to know Arabic and less important to, depends on the, the, but all UN duty stations function in one or the other, what they call sort of um, working languages. And uh, so all six, there are six, there are six, there are six official languages of the United Nations. There are more in the European Union. Um, I would, in my experience, and I've traveled a lot in the UN, I would say that if you want to be, um, if you're, there's a lot of opportunities in Geneva, and there it is really important to have good French. Um, there are some opportunities in Africa where French is definitely better than English. I think as a, probably as a rule in the European Union and also in, um, the, U, the rest of the UN, English is probably, having English skills is probably the, the, the most helpful in terms of the, the working languages. But for people who have, the more language, language ability you have, there are, there's great advantage to being able to function in more languages than English or French. 
And even though there's a certain advantage to having one of those as a native language, there are many, for example, it is not uncommon for English speakers to only know English. Is it a disadvantage to only be able to function in one language? It definitely is. And it's really advantageous. It also helps you, I think languages make your brain work differently. And some of the things that make a great international civil servant, I think, come very much hand in glove with the ability to speak more than one language really well, because they somehow make connections in a way that are different than people who are just really great at one. So, um, I, I, did that answer your question as well? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christina. We appreciate your time and your advice. Um, to stay on schedule, let's move forward and hear from Magdalena Kopal. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here and to share my story. I feel really flattered that I can do that. Um, well, I will start um, explaining my career path um, from the moment when I moved to the Netherlands, which was somewhere in the mid of 2010. And by that time, I was in mid of my 20s and I had already six years old son. So talking or speaking about some career before would be rather difficult. Um, so when I moved to the Netherlands, I had my first recruitment job. Um, so it was completely something new for me. Before, I worked only as a stewardess of flight and then if you like. So having this business commercial experience was really a novelty for me. And then I, uh, I stayed a couple of years in that company. <clears throat> it was a Dutch company. Then I worked for several other companies, Dutch or international companies. But the breaking point when I really decided I want to work for international uh, service uh, was um, when I moved to The Hague and suddenly I was surrounded by all international organizations, diplomats and civil servants, and there was ICC, ICTY, uh, OPCW, Eurojust, Europol, and I started meeting expats and listening to their stories. And then I realized like, wow, that's something that I would like to do as well. So what I have done, I didn't dare that time yet to apply to go for college to finish or to pursue my master. So I started taking uh, online courses. I take a few online courses on international relations from Leiden. I take a few classes on international law, for international public law. So there were the classes which were not for credit, but it was more for my own interest. And then somewhere, um, I was already in my 30s, as Christina mentioned, her family. I did exactly the same. So I applied to Webster IR program, and I have been admitted in 2016 to Webster. But I still continue to work for commercial companies. And it was in 2018 when I applied, when I saw position at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon at the recruitment unit. So I thought, I'm going, I'm going to give it a try. And I know that I was really lucky because I got that position. It was my first application with an international organization. And somehow I passed, I got a position, and I started to work for the STL in January 2019. Um, Christina is my boss, so I'm working on one of her um, units, and she, as she mentioned, there are three units, and I'm part of staffing unit, which is a um, recruitment unit, um, together with all my, uh, also my four colleagues. So what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it really depends on which stage of recruitment process we are, because we are stepping in also in the mid of selection process. But for us, what's ideal when we take HR case, what we call our selection process from the beginning. And then what we do, um, we are discussing the vacation, uh, vacancy announcement or VA with the hiring managers. Um, we tell them what, to, what, what will be the best, um, maybe choose a word, but usually they already know what they want to have there. Um, once the VA is finalized, we post VA online. And um, then we wait, we wait for 30 days. So that's a standard um, deadline for the application. And once the deadline closed, then we start to proceeding with the applications. We also call it like a metrics proceeding. So we collect all applications and we send them to hiring managers or ideally to selection panel. So selection panel consists from four or five people where there is chair, so who is the hiring manager and these people are deciding about selection. Um, 
what works for me is when I get to meet selection panel before we start actually um, the whole selection process, because there we can manage our expectations. They are um, telling us or telling me, informing me um, how in hurry they are, how, how urgent is that, but also as recruitment, we have some process. So sometimes it more feels like negotiating. Sometimes we have to push back because even senior staff at the, at the, at the tribunal, sometimes they are not um, familiar with the selection process. So it's very good to have this discussion and to tell them, look, from our side, this is what we can do. Um, we need some time to proceed application. We need some time to invite candidates for the written exam, also to proceed with the interviews. So that's the first stage when we are starting to discussing the whole selection process. Once they shortlist, shortlist candidates, they send it back to us, the staffing unit, and we need to screen applications on a minimum eligibility. Um, so that depends by the position. So there is a certain years of experience they have to have, education, and so on and on. Um, then we start to inviting them for the written exam. Written exam is anonymous exams, and it's a usually technical exam. So it depends also on the position. They get questions. They have certain time. Sometimes it's a two hours. Sometimes it's a five hours. Sometimes it's even 24 hours when candidates need to submit the results. And then those who succeed, then we go on to the interviews. Um, interviews might take from one day to whole week. That really also depends on a uh, number of candidates. When it comes to the interviews, my position is as um, HR ex officio. So I do see that the interviews, I do care um, that the candidates are treated properly and the selection is fair. Um, I do not have a voting right, so this all depends on the panel members. However, as HR representative, we have to ensure that the panel members are assessing uh, applicants fairly and they are not having preferential treatment or any other um, um, questions that are not uh, suitable for, for the candidate. Um, I really love my position and I tell you why, because with my position, my position actually allows me to interact with all organs of the tribunal. So I can understand the actual business or to see behind the scene, if you like. And um, for me, it's tremendously valuable and useful for my next career path within, because I, of course, I would like to go ahead with my IR studies or find a job within this topic. Um, but I see what is expected from professionals within international courts, um, the way the managers think, uh, but also what kind of priorities they have and expectations. And you also see different way of working, but also different focus from the different departments. So for example, it's a different approach from the office of the prosecutor, different way of thinking from defense, different approach from um, VPU or chambers. Um, chambers are my favorite um, part to deal with, but also in the same time, they are really, very challenging to work with. Um, I've been asked quite often whether Webster University influenced my career and if at all. And my answer is always, yes, it has enormously, but not in terms of eligibility. I would say it's rather it has introduced me to the topics within international relations and also international criminal law. And in fact, I remember it was the first class of international criminal law in action that made me totally fall in love. It was a love at the first sight, but then also there were uh, other classes like uh, international organizations or human humanitarian interventions classes. And all those information more and more made me even wanted more. So more I learned, the more I knew that there is no way back. And then I need to and have to work in, 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 in this field. Um, I can safely say that Webster classes absolutely gave me a solid knowledge background. I really do see uh, in practice what I have learned uh, in the classroom, and it helped me to understand international organizations. It helps me to understand their the mandate, why they do what they do, why sometimes they act differently. It helps me to understand also politics behind, and it helps me to understand that Christina mentions there is lots of work from the member states, lots of work from a coordination between international organizations and the state. And this kind of, at least theoretical knowledge, I definitely get, did get from, uh, from Webster. 
Um, also, when I'm sitting in the interviews, I don't feel like Alice in the Wonderland. I, I understand the interviews questions or what is being discussed. I, I understand um, what they're aiming with the questions, but of course, um, to to certain um, to certain extent. Um, moreover, as you know, Webster also connects students with practitioners and professionals. So within the IR field, so. I had several opportunities to talk to them and to also sort out my interests, what I want to do, my ambitions, because you got connected them through Webster, so it's really helped. And looking at the bigger picture, international civil service is a fascinating work because whatever position you are within the international organization, your work supports organization mandate. Hence, you do contribute to make the world a better place. And I know, however idealistic it may sound, but that's a true behind. Even if you are not directly the senior staff, but your work, it's like all teamwork. So your work also do matter and definitely supporting the organizational uh, interest. And um, what will be the, the tips for um, young professionals when applying the international organizations, of course, I would say do your research first. Zoom on the type of work you would like to do or whatever is your interest. Keep on educating yourself on the topics within the area of your interest. Um, one thing is the knowledge that schools give you, but also you need to go deeper um, because you would need to have also certain technical knowledge. Um, so the more you know, of course, the better. Um, but also do not hesitate to reach out to people who work there already. Ask them for their advice, uh, ask them how, what was their path, ask them what they would um, uh, advise to you, for example, in terms of, I don't know, maybe motivation letter or how to approach uh, the interviews. Quite often, actually, I'm receiving messages from young professionals who would like to enter international service, and I I'm happy to give them the tips. Um, so you can even ask them about the written exam, for example, um, how they approach it, maybe what was expected from them. So any kind of information will help you to prepare. And definitely, if you get invited for a written exam or if you get invited for the interview, be prepared. Because um, at, a, at the international organization level, the interviews are conducted um, as a competency-based interviews. And it's not rocket scientist. It's something that I believe if you know the system, if you know what is expected, you can train yourself for that. So you just need to have certain training and um, I believe that with that you, you, you will succeed. Um, but most importantly, as Christina mentioned, do not give up. I know it's easy for me to say because I was lucky one who just got the position at the first shot. However, in my experience from the private sector, commercial sector, as many times I heard rejections, no, no, no. And I know it may, can make you feel frustrating or insecure about yourself. However, do not let rejection to demotivate you because if you, I, I believe that if you really want something and you will go for that sooner or later, you will um, achieve it. And also, as Christina mentioned, there are so many opportunities, so many jobs within the United Nations so if you as a young professional already have certain experience, sooner or later, um, the good position will come uh, in your way. And finally, let me also um, share my experience um, from the transition from commercial private sector to international public environment. I say it was strange and good in the same time. Maybe I would say strangely, strangely good, if that's even an expression. Uh, because I did work in international organization, uh, international environment before, but it was commercial. So now I move to international public environment. So from focusing on the profit to focusing on the mandate. So that was something that I had to kind of process those, that there are no stakeholders who are asking you to make profit to reach your target, but there are stakeholders for you. So for my case, it's an external, uh, external uh, customers are candidates, internal customers are hiring managers or senior staff that I'm interacting with, but they do expect you to deliver. 
they do um, expect you to provide a service. So I still feel that I'm giving a service that I'm trained from commercial sector, and I have to say it helped me a lot. Being trained in commercial sector is absolutely good skill and good value that you can bring to public sector. Therefore, if you have the opportunity to take the first jobs within the commercial sector, just do it. Don't be afraid that once you start in commercial sector, you will never move to public. Absolutely not. And quite opposite, it can help you. It, it, it gives you some skills that maybe your colleagues who are already international um, organization, they don't have them. So it makes you only unique. So definitely don't be afraid of that. Um, but of course, every place has its shortfalls, right? So it's just about what does feel you, what do you want? And for example, for me, the public international environment, I believe it suits to my character, it suits to my personality, who I am. I have amazing colleagues around. So, so far I'm being, I've been very happy since. I um, am having great time. However, I don't take it for granted. I know that this is then an uh, ad hoc tribunal and um, its judicial activities will come to an end one day, sooner or later. And therefore, I need to keep on working on myself. I need to keep on working hard. I need to keep on educating myself to be, to be prepared for the next chapter of my career, whatever that may be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, if anybody has questions, as always, please throw them in the chat. Um, I think it's very fascinating that you got this job in recruitment because you get this behind the scenes view of how people are hired in international organizations. Is there any um, fascinating insight that you found that was surprising to you and is a good behind the scenes tip to um, the recruitment process? I don't know how much can I say, Christina. <laughs> of course, the selection process is highly confidential. Um, but you know what, what I learned? Um, I always felt, if I can say, insecure in front of people who came from Ivy League universities, for example. Um, I always thought that training from these universities make you perfect professional that can get any job you want. How surprised I was, I said in interviews, and I met many applicants who came from Harvard, Columbia, and so on, and they didn't succeed. So I'm not saying that they completely failed, but then we had one applicant for entry-level position who just um, graduated from Leiden University with zero experience, and she actually beat it candidates from Ivy League. So. That was, for me, that surprising point that not everything comes with the great papers, but it's a lot about your personality and what you can, you can do or how you can sell yourself as well. That is definitely something I think about as well, and I think a lot of our members think about um, not having that Ivy League University experience and how you can still stand out, because in the U.S. sometimes it can feel that it's all about the school. Right. I have a question from Brandon. Magdalena, thank you for sharing your experience. Both you and Christina have remarked that application process is competency based. How is that different from what you experience in the private sector? Very different because in the private sector, interviews are very less structured. In the private sector, interviews are mainly having conversation and Either they like you or they don't. I believe that the private sector is a lot about personal click and, of course, the knowledge that you need to have. However, competency-based interviews, you really need to tackle all points. You really need to bring what they want you to hear. What was your role? What was your position? How did you contribute? And you really need to go also into your negative um, skills as well, and you need to turn it into positive. So um, I would say that competency-based interview, it's easier in a way that you can train yourself. In the private sector, I always felt that you're just going for a free ride and you don't know what's going to happen. Are there any resources available for people to prepare for these competency-based interviews? Yes, 
What I did, um, I Googled a lot. That's what I feel like a major research. Um, I Googled a lot. You find um, some material also on the UN website. There are also some videos. And as I said, just reach out to other people. I, I'm sure that they will be willing to help you. Any other questions? I have one last question, or maybe not last one. And um, that's regarding at the end of your speech, you told that you kind of have a specific understanding that you're making the world better. Mm -hmm. But speaking most largely, I would say, about the career opportunities in IR field, your experience, I just keep hearing that a lot of wonderful students are getting discouraged because of the very fact that they believe for some reason that they could not make the change because the system is already um, established and you can't do nothing, you can't bring novelty, you can't show that you can here for what the better, not just for financial reasons. What would you, what would be your support, uh, advice and approach towards it? What would you say to those students who really start becoming discouraged and even though being in love in public policy field, they keep looking for other opportunities in different fields just because of that reason and that stereotype. I think uh, that they cannot make anything, uh, that, that they cannot make the change. What would you, what would be your idea on this? I would say not manage your expectations, that, that's a little bit maybe harsh to say, but don't have expectations that you as a single person can um, change the world, literally, because you need to always see the bigger picture. So in, for example, in my case or Christina's case, we work for the tribunal that is prosecuting something that happened and we believe with our support, with our work, we are supporting that um, there will be fine uh, justice for those victims. So you, you need to take it in a small steps. You cannot say that I'm now working for the UN and now I'm gonna solve um, conflict in the Middle East or um, big world troubles, absolutely not. And it, it's never gonna happen, right? So you need to see it in a smaller step that what you do, it's like ant job, but we are part of bigger team and we all contribute um, uh, with our actions. And, but you never know, like maybe some of us will make it to a higher position when you will somewhere, maybe some of you will be the general secretary and then we can talk about a bigger impact. But my advice will be, of course I have those days, sometimes I think whether there is justice in the world and whether we as the UN, we do enough. Of course, you, you face criticism a lot. But you have to have always believe in, in what you do and uh, where you are going. Thank you. And we have a couple last questions for Christina, actually, about networking. If you believe that networking is an important skill in the UN, and how do you connect with professionals outside of your immediate working area, if at all? I'm one of those people that I think of myself as a terrible networker. Um, I'm myself. If you if you looked at my social media uh, component, I, I have the world's worst LinkedIn. Um, but I, I am. I think I'm I'm good in person, um, and I try to. Um, I, I I think networking does have value, and I think that knowing people and and working, but. Everyone's form of networking is going to be slightly different, and there are different ways to network, and there, there's not only one, one, one way which is right. So for me, I've never, ever been very good. There, there are some people for whom they get their, they, they continue a network via a kind of lots of publications. They interact with each other in, in professional societies, um, and they connect in that way. I, I've never been very good at that, and so it's not for me. But I do know that people do that very successfully. I think there are also people who are better, I'm just generally better in person. So my form of networking, um, when, I left my, when I left my gig at ICCY, went to the secretariat. One of the things that I, I knew in myself was 
the ICTY itself is also a limited mandate tribunal. And my view was that I was going to do what I needed to do and assist as many people from ICTY as I could. So when I got to a position where I had opportunities, I was sharing those. It was just very, very informal. I would let people know that things were happening. I would, I, I just, I give my email address frequent, frankly and openly to, to anybody, in, including you guys. Um, and if you want, if you want to write me and you want to have a question, I'm always available. So I'll, I'll send an, I'll send an, I'll send a truthful answer back to anyone. I'll give anybody my, the guidance that, um, that I can give. And if I can help somebody get their first leg up, I will definitely do so. So I think that that, I, I think there are probably a lot of people like myself. I got as many, I probably had as many people do the same kind of thing for me. Um, and then there's just, again, there's the play, volunteering is a form of networking, not just volunteering to be an intern, but also just when you actually get an opportunity, whether it be a short or long-term opportunity, looking around and seeing outside of your work group, who can I help? I have a really, I have a colleague that has been a colleague of mine in all three organizations in The Hague that I've worked in. And he is somebody who is universally known as the person that you call for any IT problem. And when he talks about his career, both before he joined, he came to The Hague and joined one of the courts and tribunals, the common denominator in his story is he's the person who's always there to help. And that's a form of networking that I at least find useful. It works for me. To close off, Magdalena, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I do network. I cannot say from me because I don't consider myself as the outgoing person, so I really need to step out of my comfort zone, but I do network. Um, I go to many conferences. I also start to be members of some associations. So, for example, even not being a lawyer, I'm a member of Association of Defense Councils practicing in front of international tribunals, and I go to their meetings and try to talk people. I do prefer networking more in person on the conferences or some trainings rather than on LinkedIn. I don't have LinkedIn account. So yes and no. I, I, I try to do it. I see benefits. But I can understand that not everybody um, finds it easy to, to approach um, strange people, strangers. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I would like to appreciate you for coming today. Have a little. Thank you very much thank for you. giving us. Thank you very much. We're so thankful to have all the enthusiastic group of students dedicated to their career prospects and um, furthering their education. So thank you, Christina and Magdalena, for all the insightful information and for motivating us to invest in our futures. And this is our final event for the summer, and we're going to be working hard um, for the rest of the summer to plan our fall schedule. So if anybody wants to reach out with what they'd like to see for this organization for the upcoming season, we are open to hearing it all. So thank you everyone and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.